part of the Press Play Podcast Network. What's good, everybody, and welcome into the Full 40 Podcast, where we talk all things college basketball. I'm your host, and I go by the name of Taylor Vanderbilt. First and foremost, man, I'm so excited for you guys to be here with me today. We have so much to dive into as we are in the throngs of the conference schedule. Uh, We're going to talk about a little bit of what's happened this week in basketball, but both what has happened and what's going to happen this coming weekend. Um, We're going to talk about the top 25 poll that was released on Monday, and I I have some problems with it. I have some problems with it. Uh, As well as we're going to get to my conference rankings. And last but not least, uh, ESPN has dropped their top 25 player rankings as well as an updated bracketology. So I'm going to dive into those, give my reaction to those. So without further ado, let's get into it. So this week in basketball has already been somewhat eventful. Um, We've had some big time losses already. Uh, We've had some crazy finishes uh and it's setting up what could be or what is in my opinion going to be a really good weekend uh, of basketball uh the first game i want to dive into of course everyone saw it last night texas texas tech took down baylor uh 65 to 62 um it it wasn't really like one of those games where you know one team fell apart or anything like that it was simply just it was simply just a matter of uh, Texas Tech just just came out with the win. It was a hard fought game. Uh, no team really outplayed the other, in my opinion. Uh, some people might, you know, look at that as as how they may, but in my opinion, I don't think either team outplayed the other. I just think it was a really hard fought game, and somebody had to win, and Texas Tech was that somebody. Um, that leads to now Gonzaga probably rising to one next week. Uh, obviously, nobody wants that <laughs> um, as they play in the uh, JV conference. Uh, uh, but all jokes aside, Gonzaga will probably rise to number one and probably just keep that spot um, until tournament time, to be honest with you. Uh, but I really do love uh, seeing great games like this, especially at, at the kind of the, I would say not the beginning of conference play, but um, we, we really haven't even gotten into the real conference schedule yet. And to see a game this close and this good between two teams that I think are really, really good and could both make deep runs in March, uh, it was pretty cool to watch. Um, on top of that, last night as well, we had uh, three more games, in my opinion, that were just really, really good. Uh, the first one I want to start with, so I'm going to stay in the Big 12. Kansas and Iowa State was honestly a great game. And I really – I really personally think Iowa State blew the game um, at the end. And, and here's my um, my kind of how I see it. So uh, they hit, Kansas hits two free, or hits two free throws to go up 60 to 59 with about, mm, I want to say it was about 20, 15 to 20 seconds left. So Iowa State comes down uh, with the ball, and they go so fast. Like, I mean, they were going at light speed trying to get a bucket, and it didn't really make sense to me because I'm not really a last shot person, like dwindle the clock down, shoot with two seconds left, try to be the hero. Um, I'm more of in the middle of what happened last night and, and what I just explained. Get the, get a shot up with about seven, eight seconds left, uh, maybe even five. That way, if it comes off, you can get a rebound, tip out anything, a la Chris Bosh, uh, to Ray Allen type type of thing, but Iowa State went so fast and they scored with about I want to say it was about twelve seconds left on the clock. They got a nice easy or, or quick layup, but I said it and I said it uh, to the people I was watching the game with. I was like, they scored way too fast. They scored too fast, and sure enough, um, and I think Iowa State actually hit a jump shot. It was a pull up jump shot, which I was like, that's a bad shot. A, but B, he made it. And there was too much time left on the clock. So sure enough, Kansas gets the ball. And as we all saw, they go down the court, hit what's basically a a game-winning layup with about seven or so seconds left. Um, And it was just a wild finish. And again, like like I said about Baylor and Texas Tech, I absolutely loved the um, intensity of the game, the way that 
uh, the way that they kind of, it was literally back and forth and back and forth and back and forth the whole time. I would say had the lead at halftime, but of course, Kansas in the fog will somehow miraculously find a way to pull these games out, and they did it yet again. Um, next up is actually, we're going to go down to the south or over from the south. I guess we were already kind of in a southern territory. We're going to go over to the great state of Alabama, who, uh, in more more or less in Tuscaloosa, and they've seen their fair share of loss the past this this week. Um, not only losing to Georgia, but then going home and losing to Auburn uh, on the basketball court it was I'm sure it wasn't wasn't fun to watch uh, in consecutive nights. But Auburn to me is one of the best teams in the country. Um, obviously, they're led by Jabari Smith, who I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but Auburn looks Again, like the best team, one of the better teams in the country. Bruce Pearl has got the guys rocking. Uh, they're fifteen to one right now, ranked fourth in the country. Uh, I just don't like. There's really no team in the SEC to me that can, I think that can really contend and compete with them. Um, Kentucky possibly, Tennessee possibly, but I both think that they have to be on their games at the top of their games to really compete with, with Auburn at full strength. But last night they played Alabama. It was a really good game. I thought Auburn had control, felt like Auburn had control of the game. Most of the game, in my opinion. Um, but I do like the fact that, uh, sorry, here trying to pull up some, pull up some stats. Uh, which I can't seem to do, but yeah, I think Auburn had the control of the game for the most of the most of the game. There were some questionable uh, decisions by Alabama towards the end of the game as well that I really think just kind of put it away. Um, but but yeah, no, it was it was awesome. And I think the best part uh, to me about it, it, with it being a rivalry game, is they did the uh, they brought kind of the football celebration Auburn did to the basketball court. Uh, you know, and doing the the Mr. Miyagi Karate Kid celebration, I thought it was amazing and awesome. So, so yes, yeah, another great college basketball game uh, here here this week. And we we're literally only at Wednesday, guys. We're only at Wednesday, and we have Wednesday night as well. We have tonight through the weekend, and we've already gotten so many good games so far. Um, next up, and kind of the last game I want to kind of get into. Uh, was a big one, uh, USC and Stanford. Now, USC had reached their highest AP poll ranking, I think, since 1974. Uh, I might want to fact check me on that, but I believe it's since the 70s. And they proceeded to find a way to lose to Stanford um, down or down. or I don't, I don't even, where is Stanford? I, I have, I just had a mind, Palo Alto, down in Palo Alto. There we go. Well, they lost to Stanford down in Palo Alto by six points, which is really eye-opening for me because not only was USC undefeated, but they were a uh, six- or seven-point favorite going into this game. Um, Stanford had not been playing really well at all. Uh, you know, coming, I think they may have had one game since their COVID pause, whereas USC, I believe, has had two or had had two, and they looked, uh, they looked okay. Um, kind of similar. I wouldn't say as bad as Duke has. Since their COVID pause are out of sync, I want to—I don't want to say bad because Duke and USC haven't looked bad at all, but just out of sync. That that I haven't played basketball in a while, feeling, and that's what I think we saw out of USC um, last night. Uh, we, it finally kind of reared its ugly head, as you know, being out of sync really does take a toll on you and your team, and especially when you ca- when a team like Stanford comes in and they're a rival. And they they have momentum. They're at home, and now they're kind of it's weighing on your mind. And I think that's what happened with Duke and Miami this past weekend. Is Duke was obviously the better team, but it was a situation where Duke was coming off COVID pause. They had um, had not really gotten their groove back since then. Wendell Moore wasn't playing his best. They turned the ball over seventeen times, and. I kind of think, like I said, I kind of think it was the same same type of deal here. Like, USC, I mean, they only turned the ball over 11 times, but they only they shot 6 for 21 for 3, and overall they shot 
42% from the field. Um, so both of those stats right there, as well as shooting 65% from the free throw line, which in my opinion will get you beat. Um, I think 70 or more is what you should strive to be as a team. Um, that might be a little hot for some people, but uh, I, shooting less than 70% will definitely get you beat, and that's exactly what happened last night. So uh, a lot of great, great games so far this week, but we also have a lot of good ones to look forward to, including tonight. Um, Villanova and Xavier, by the, time you guys, by the time you guys hear this, that game will have been played. But Villanova and Xavier is really, going to be a really, really good game to me. Um, it's Villanova's on the road. Last time they played uh, earlier this season, Villanova got the best of Xavier. Um, I really think this game comes down to Colin Gillespie. Uh, if they let him run free, then they will. Villanova will win. If they don't, Xavier has a really good chance because they are literally – I watched them play earlier this year in Barclays. They are one of the most uh, – I don't want to say versatile teams, but honestly, they are one of the most versatile teams in that all five players on the floor can get you a bucket. All five players on the floor are, you know, have some experience and can make plays. They're really, really a um, a solid, a solid, solid team, in my opinion. Uh, next up, another one, another good one for tonight is LSU in Florida. Uh, I think that it'll be a really good defensive battle. Uh, between them, but I honestly think LSU is one of the most underrated teams in America right now. Uh, they're playing great, coming off wins against Tennessee and Kentucky, so I personally think they'll get Florida, but there is a possibility that Florida, uh, if they can find a way to click on offense um, and continue to turn teams over like they have been, I really do think that there is a way that Florida comes out with a, uh, with a victory. And I'm saying this as if Florida is not a three-point favorite in this game going in, but to me, the lines don't matter. What's in between the lines matters. And it, that, this game is basically just going to come down to who can, turn, who can turn who over the most um, and who can make free throws and, and hit a couple threes. And I think that, that's, where, um, that's where it's going to lie. Uh, coming up for th- tomorrow, so as you're listening to this, or Thursday, Ohio State and Wisconsin play. That's a really, really good game, in my opinion. And I'm really not a fan of Big Ten basketball, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but Ohio State and Wisconsin is going to be a really good game. EJ Liddell uh, versus Johnny Davis, two of the best players in the country. And I'll, I'll get into them a little bit later. Um, but I really, really think that it's going to be a really, really fun game to watch. I'm excited to see um, EJ Liddell on another kind of big stage. And this is also for bragging rights in the Big Ten as both teams are going to come into the game four and one. Um, also on Thursday, this is a late night one. Um, if, for all you West Coast people or you uh, night owls, BYU and Gonzaga. I really love this matchup. I'm a big fan of uh, both teams and both their styles of play. Um, but Baylor and Gon- or Baylor, BYU and Gonzaga – I think it has the potential to be a really, really underrated game. Obviously, Gonzaga is stacked. Uh, Timmy, Chet Holmgren, you know, the list goes on. Nimhard, you could literally just name players for days. But I do think that this is a rivalry game. BYU is a very, very good team. This is for bragging rights and the top of the uh, WCC so I really do think that it will be a really fun game to watch. I'm really excited to watch it as I haven't seen um, – I haven't really watched a lot of Gonzaga outside of their big games this year just because of the, the competition they have played outside of those games hasn't really just been the greatest um, or even just kind of up to mid, mid-level mid D1 status in my opinion. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and then this weekend, this Saturday, we have – some really good ones is or one I know for me it's two really good ones. Uh, first, we have Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, Tennessee and Kentucky is going to be a very interesting game to watch for me. Uh, I think uh, Kentucky is hitting their stride slowly. I know they just lost to LSU, but that was without their point guard Severe Wheeler. So I really do think now Kentucky is starting to kind of figure it out, hit their stride. And on the flip side. You have a Tennessee team who is yet coming off a win against South Carolina, but before that, they had a loss against Alabama. Uh, they won a close game at Ole Miss that, in my opinion, they pr- 
probably shouldn't have won. They had some uh, Ole Miss had some cramping issues, and I, I mean that's why you play the game. But at the end of the day, uh, I really do think if Ole Miss's uh, point guard and main ball handler isn't uh, doesn't go out with cramps, and their other secondary ball handler uh, is playing in the game, that Ole Miss wins that game. And then they lost to LSU. Uh, so to me, and not and I almost forgot as well as Arizona, they played really really close. Some questionable calls, but for both sides in that game. But that's, again, that's why you play the game. So, basically, I say all that to say, in Tennessee's last five games, they could easily have been one and four. They haven't been playing great, but they've been doing enough in some of these games to just get by. But I definitely think on Saturday they're going to have to find a way to play like the Tennessee that we saw earlier this season. Um when they were when they beat North Carolina and when they were beating Colorado, like that Tennessee team, we need is the one we need to see in order for them, in my opinion, to beat Kentucky. Um, I just don't see it. Um, Kentucky, for the for the most part, has been kind of running ruck shot. Uh, yes, they have a loss to LSU, but LSU, as I've said, is one of my sleeper teams. is one of the best teams in the country. So, uh, you know it. it kind of is what it is on that but I really do think uh that's going to be a great game um another really good game actually is uh or intriguing game to me is LSU and Arkansas and I've already said my piece about LSU so I won't go back into that but Arkansas is on a bit of a slide right now they're 0-3 in the SEC currently which is surprising to me considering they started basically 10-0 um or excuse me, 9-0 and before losing to Oklahoma. And it's been like ever since then, they've just kind of fallen off. Hofstra then beat them. Uh, their only win since uh, since losing to Oklahoma is against Elon. And it was, I mean, Elon's ha- is not really competition from Arkansas, but they lost to Mississippi State. Um, they've lost to Vanderbilt. And they also lost to Texas A&M. So, uh, they they need this win. They need this win bad to kind of not to kind of to stay afloat in the SEC. Um, obviously, I don't think they're going to win it with three losses already, and the top you know top teams having only one. But this would be a big step in kind of chipping away and trying to get back into it. And again, when you get to the end of the season and things are getting tight, who knows? Some teams may fall off. Some teams may come on strong. Arkansas could be in a position where they could contend to have one of those top three or four seeds in the SEC tournament. But they need this game. They need this game without a doubt. Uh, Next up is Texas and Iowa State. Texas and Iowa State, to me, is going to be a really interesting game. Uh, Texas still hasn't hit their stride yet, I don't think. I feel like they're gelling a little bit more. But watching them, they, they don't look out of sync. It just doesn't look, to me, like a team that is like fully like a well-oiled machine they they just look like they're kind of truck struggling kind of drudging along drudging along i don't even know if that's a word (laughs) but they kind of just look like they're they're almost there but they're not there yet Uh, but i do think that a win over a team like iowa state who's ranked above them um it would be a great win for texas uh especially because they're three and one in the big 12 obviously you want to and kind of keep their their footing there with that being one of the better conferences, if not the best conference in basketball. We'll get into that in a second. But Texas and Iowa State, I think, will be a great game. Iowa State obviously needs this win. They're one and three in the uh, Big Twelve. They need this win more than <laughs> more than they know. So really interested to to watch all of those games or some part of all of those games this weekend. I think it's going to be a really really fun slate and weekend of games and. Uh, I'm excited to come back and talk with you guys about them next week. Hey everyone, it's JD from the Hyman Podcast. Back by popular demand, I'm excited to let you know that new episodes of the Hyman Podcast will drop every other Monday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We're going to continue the conversations we started last season and keep having those hard conversations. There is so much in store for you this season, and I'm excited to share it with you. Subscribe today so you don't miss a single moment. The Hyman Podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. We 
got some more things to dive into. Uh, I want to talk about my conference rankings. Uh, I believe that a lot of people have been like, this is the best conference and this is, but I have a top five that I think most most people uh, would agree with um, when it comes to uh, college basketball. So let's start out with number five. We're going to start from the bottom here and go up, and I'm going to explain to you guys why I think this conference is where they are in my top five. So coming in at number five for me, let me get to it. Coming in at number five for me is the Pac-12 conference. Um, I, I like what the Pac-12 has going on. Um, to me, I think one of my biggest kind of um, metrics that I use when I look at conferences and how I rank conferences is not only how competitive you are, how competitive each team is separately, whether uh, in, especially out of conference, but how competitive the conference is within said conference. If, if the last team um, in your conference can knock off the, the top team, then that is a plus for me because that means that throughout there, there's talent throughout it. That means that there are solid teams throughout. So, yeah, so coming in at number five for me is the Pac-12. Um, right off the bat, you see they start off strong with three teams in the top seven of last week's poll, uh, Arizona, UCLA, and USC. And then right behind them is Colorado, who is not a bad team at all. Um, they are 11-3 and three on the year. And then Stanford, who we just saw beat number five USC last night, is a really good team or is, is a solid team as well. I think they're kind of hitting their stride and they're figuring some things out. I don't, obviously, I don't think they're a deep tournament team or anything like that but I do think they're a solid team and then you have Oregon Washington State Cal just Washington Arizona State kind of those mid-tier teams that aren't necessarily the best um, when you look at it like on a national perspective but in terms of just a conference as a whole I don't think those are just terrible teams uh, I mean when, when you look at it um, excuse me I'm something in my throat uh, but yeah, like a team like Washington State, they only lost to two by two points to USC. And granted, a loss is a loss, but still, at the end of the day, a two point loss to a USC team who was in the top five, that means you played them pretty close. That means you played them pr pretty doggone good. And to me, that's a that's a that's a big plus. So, the Pac-12 for me comes in at number five. Uh, like I said, I think they are somewhat top heavy, but I do think that as you go throughout the conference, that it is still a solid conference. And any team can be any team on any given night. Uh, coming in at number four for me is the conference that we were just talking about just a little bit, and that's the SEC. Uh, I think the SEC is a very, very good conference this year. I really do think outside of Georgia that every – in, I would say South Carolina is what well, well no 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 I'll leave South Carolina in there but I say outside of Georgia that I don't think believe that there is outside, let me let me rephrase I'm trying to get my thoughts together guys outside of Georgia I don't think that I think that every single team can beat any team in the conference I mean and we've kind of already seen that a little bit but truthfully I mean, if you just go from top down, Auburn, A&M, A&M's 3-0 right now in the SEC, and they're not ranked. Missouri is top five in the SEC right now, and they're not ranked. But you have teams like Alabama and Tennessee who are both 2-2 two and two and below these teams. Mississippi State uh, is a solid team. South Carolina has proven that they can be a solid team. Ole Miss is 1-2 and two in the SEC. Um, and they're a solid team. So I, I just think for me throughout top to bottom in the SEC, I really do think that they are one of the premier basketball conferences, I, but they're not in my top three. And the main reason they're not in my top three is because, excuse me, is because how they've performed nationally. So big games, Tennessee, for example, uh, Tennessee lost to Villanova. That's their pretty much their big national game. Uh, Alabama's pretty, in my opinion, has done the best job uh, on a national schedule, but to that point, outside of Auburn, but to that point, they lost to Memphis, they've lost to Davidson, and they've lost 
to uh, Iona. So three really bad losses, and they're 11 and five. So yes, they have some really good wins over teams like Gonzaga, but they also have really, really bad losses over teams like Iona. And I know they're coached by the GOAT Patino, but um, I can't overlook that when I'm looking at just the conference as a whole. And, and I know Iona's good. They're 12 and three. I know, I know. But moving on to my next conference on the list, conference number three, and that for me is the Big East. And some of you might be looking at me sideways like the Big East, but yes, the Big East conference to me is one of the most underrated conferences in basketball this year. Uh, you have Providence, Villanova, Xavier, Creighton, Marquette, Seton Hall, and St. John's, and UConn and Butler. And Butler is on sort of a down year this year, but all the teams I just named are very, very solid teams. And all the teams I just named have a very solid opportunity at making the tournament. St. John's might be right there, but for the most part, every team I just named could, has a really good shot at making the tournament. On top of that, if you look at their, like I said, one of the metrics that I look at is how well your conference competes with the other teams in its conference. Um, or how well the teams in conference compete against each other, rather. And you can already see it right now. Four, there's a lot of losses there. A lot of teams have – no team is undefeated in conference, which lets me know that it is very, very competitive within the Big East. Uh, as I said earlier tonight, we have Villanova and Xavier. That's literally number two and three in the Big East right now. Um, and they're, And to me, I just don't see how the Big East just – continuously gets overlooked obviously it's not a power five conference but it, like we all know in basketball the Big East should have always been the sixth conference and if not number one when it came to basketball so that's why I love the Big East next is the Big 12 the Big 12 to me is and this one's I was kind of torn because as I said earlier I don't like the Big 10 but I got to give them their props they're going to be my number one but I'll get to them in a second but the Big 12 for me was uh is is definitely my number two conference i mean obviously the number one team in the country granted they just lost the number one team in the country uh is in this conference as well as kansas texas tech texas um iowa state so there's very good teams from top to bottom first first off secondly as i've said the metric that i kind of go by is how you how well your the teams in your conference compete against one another and as we saw last night and as we can see looking at the conference win loss any team in the in the Big 12 can get beat by any team in the Big 12 on any given night. Uh, when you have a team that's ranked number 15 in the country, but they're one and three in conference, that lets you know how good that conference is. Or or maybe that team isn't a, a real contender, but I do think Iowa State is a real contender. So we're going to say that lets me know how good the conference is. Um, and then when you look at teams like West Virginia, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State that are in the middle of the pack, to me, they're no slouch. Even TCU, they're ten and two on the year, but they're zero and one in conference. So there's a lot, a lot of good teams. If not from top to bottom, there isn't really a bad team. Maybe Kansas State, or you could say Kansas State would be the bad team uh, in this conference. But excuse me, but even when you look at when you look at their schedule, who they played, they they've played teams tough. Uh, Arkansas, they lost by eight. Illinois, they also lost by eight. Same score. That's crazy. But they beat a Wichita State. They right there with Marquette, lost by one. So literally, it's just I wouldn't say lack of talent, but they're not for them to be the worst team in the Big Twelve, and for them to look how they've looked, uh, it, it's not really conducive. I mean, if you look at their losses, OU by two, West Virginia by two, they easily, easily could have three more wins. Um, and be 11 and three very easily. So, so the Big 12 is definitely a conference to be reckoned with, in my opinion. But last but not least, and I hate as an ACC guy, I hate giving props to the Big 10, <laughs> but they it's no denying it, they are the best conference um, in basketball. And it, it's really no way around that. I mean, when you look at the teams that they have, and the players that are in this conference, it's just it's amazing. When you have Illinois, Michigan State, Ohio State, Wisconsin, and right there. Those are the top four in the Big Ten right now. And those teams are some of the best teams in the country when you look at it. 
from a national perspective. Then you followed it up with an Indiana, a Rutgers, and a Purdue. The number seven team in the country is also the number seven team in the Big Ten. So when I tell you that the competitiveness between these teams in this conference is so, so great, it's true. They, they have some really competitive games. I mean, you have a team like Iowa, who's 11-4, and four, and they're in the bottom four. Northwestern, who is a very, very solid team this year, bottom four. Maryland, who they are shaky with the ball. They, they need some better ball handling, um, some, some more scoring. But they're, they're not a bad team. They're 8-7 and seven and 0-4 oh and in the Big Ten. So when you look at it holistically, the Big Ten, there is no conversation this year. From top to bottom, any team can compete with any team on any given night, as we saw with Rutgers and Purdue, as we hopefully see with Ohio State and Wisconsin. Um, and, and like I said, I, I really, these are my top five conferences. I had some honorable mentions, but there's no reason to get into those because they really don't matter, um, in, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but lastly, sorry, but with all that being said and talking about conference rankings, I really want to get into this. AP top 25 poll from this week and let me let me I gotta pull it up I gotta get it right here in front of me so I can make sure I have all my ducks in a row so is uh if I haven't disclosed this already to uh to you guys I am a Duke fan I am partial to the Blue Devils but I am also uh very aware of my biases and try to keep them out of um you know of these type of, of things so but i couldn't help looking at the ap top 25 poll when it came out on monday knowing that as a duke fan we lost to miami on saturday i was very intrigued to see where we would kind of fall so the first thing i noticed is that um we dropped down and we being duke dropped down to the eighth spot and while that was very surprising to me there was a lot of things that surprised me more for example, uh, Villanova at 14. Villanova has the most losses, I believe, outside of Tennessee. And in the top 25, I think Tennessee and Alabama both have four as well. Um, but they're ranked accordingly, in my opinion. But Villanova being ranked 14th with four losses is really kind of puzzling to me simply because they are they're, – they're not – they're – they're not winning. I don't know what they're being judged on, if it's the Villanova of old or what. I don't know what the poll, people who do the poll were looking at, but how do you have a team with four losses um, at number 14? And then you have a team like Texas Tech at 19. You have a team like uh, Providence at 23. Teams that are in there, which they are in the same conference as Villanova, Providence, Seton Hall, all less losses and granted Villanova does have some solid wins but at the end of the day it's kind of like I I don't really know what we're doing here next up we're going to talk about LSU LSU I think should be higher than they are I think the committee or or the the voters rather um doesn't really respect LSU yes they're at 12 but they're 14 and 1 with two wins over Tennessee and Kentucky like, I don't know, and both who are ranked, by the way, obviously. So I don't know what else they need to see from LSU to put them in the top 10. I mean, they're 14-1. and one. You have a team up there like Arizona. Um, you have a team up there like Arizona who, in my opinion, from watching them play, uh, one second, like, I don't, I'm not going to say they're not good. They're a good team, but I just don't get how a team like Arizona whose biggest win to this point is honestly against a Michigan team who we found come to find out is not really that good I guess you could say Illinois now um, a four point win over Illinois but their next biggest game really was against Tennessee which they lost so I mean granted like I said it was some questionable calls in that game but at the end of the day they still lost so how do you have a team like Arizona who really hasn't beaten anybody or done anything and has one loss to another team on this list, how do you have them at at number six? Um, especially when you have a team like 
like under them, like Purdue and Duke, whose two losses have come against two really, really solid teams, as well as Purdue, who lost to Rutgers, who on any given night can can score with the best of them. Um, or you or in another um, sorry, I lost my whole train of thought. But I said that to say when you have a team like Arizona above teams like Purdue, Duke, Kansas, and they Michigan State even, Houston, and they played absolutely nobody, uh, it just really doesn't make sense to me. Um and same thing with uh UCLA. UCLA to me is is a very, very good team. Don't get it twisted. I think UCLA has all the makings to, to have a deep run, but they haven't played in a while. Um, I don't know exactly how long it's been since they've last uh, last played a game, but they haven't played in, in, in a good bit. So my thinking and the way I've always kind of been is that if you aren't playing, uh, you know, if you don't, if you, well, actually, no, they just played last week. Sorry, uh, I, I missed that. But my thing is, they haven't really beaten anybody in a while. Uh, their biggest win to this point is Villanova at home in November. Um, since then, I mean, they beat Colorado, which is a very, very uh, uh, Colorado is not a slouch team at all. Um, but their two wins since have been Long Beach State, and they beat Kyle by eight. So, like. How do you have them? How do you justify having them at number three? They haven't beaten anybody. They haven't done anything. Um, it's kind of similar to the argument that I'm about to make about Gonzaga when they rise to number one next week. It's like, okay, Gonzaga's number one. They probably going to rot that out for the rest of the season because they play absolutely nobody outside of BYU and maybe Utah State. So how do you? How are we justifying as the voters? How are they justifying uh, that? So. Hopefully they get it together next week. I don't want to see this. I don't want to uh, come here and see where we're talking about the same thing and them not ranking teams like they should. So, uh, and lastly, I was going to get into the top twenty-five player rankings, but um, or I'm sorry, I was going to get into bracketology a little bit, but I want to save that for next week and let these games kind of play out and really, really dive into it next week. But ESPN, uh, or this is what I want to talk about. ESPN dropped their top 25 players in uh, college basketball. I think this is the second time they've done it this year. And these always interest me because I just love to see where um, where their perce- perception of players are versus the kind of national social media and my own perception of these players. Um, so I'll just give you, I'll just rattle off the top 25 right quick. And then I'll kind of go into, you know, where I think uh, there were some discrepancies for me. So, uh, or maybe I'll just do it as we go. So, number one, Johnny Davis, obviously best player in college basketball currently. Um, he is everything that Wisconsin it is. It was, he goes, Wisconsin goes, obviously. But he has really been on fire. There's not much that you can kind of say about him negatively. Right now, he is pretty much the front runner for National Player of the Year. Boom. That's it. Nothing else needs to be said about Johnny Davis. Uh, as we go down, you have Kofi Cockburn from Illinois. Obviously, uh, he, he was going to be uh, – he was amazing last year. He's just continued that this year. Rebounding machine. As this, And as we talk about a rebounding machine, Oscar Shibwe is the best college rebounder I've, I've ever seen with my own two eyes. This man literally is a walking 10 to 15 rebounds. It doesn't make sense. And he's and he's also starting to put the ball in the hole a lot as well. Um, the I think against Georgia, he had 29. So he's really the key for Kentucky, which is crazy to think about a transfer, not a not a freshman. Uh, not a not a guy that you know had been there, but a transfer has come into Kentucky and been the guy. They I feel like they have they tried to do that a few times over Kyle's kind of tenure, but they have actually found um, the the probably the best transfer, arguably. I don't really know who's transferred into Kentucky like that, but I think this might be one of the best transfers Kentucky's ever had. Um, Ocha Abaji, amazing player for Kansas, really just their do it all guy. Um, and now this is where I start to have some discrepancies. So as you said, as I said earlier, I'm partial to Duke. 
And Wendell Moore Jr. not being in the top five of this list is a complete outrage to me. Um, he literally is the the most do it all player in the country. He runs point guard for Duke. He can run two. He can re- he rebounds. He assist, like he does it all for the. He's the reason that they are kind of in the positions, the big games that they've won. He's been pretty much the reason in terms of keeping them steady, making sure um, he's the as the primary ball handler, making sure things go as planned. Granted, he's kind of had a uh, he's kind of backed off a little bit since they've come back from the COVID pause, but I expect him to fully, fully get back to what he was, basically averaging, excuse me, basically shooting like sixty three percent, averaging five to six assists a game. I mean, he was he was it was insane. So for him not to be in the top five is a problem for me. Um, another issue I have with this list is Chet Holmgren still being above. Uh, a lot of players like EJ Liddell, um, Trace Trace Jackson Davis from Indiana, Jabari Smith. I don't I don't understand what why he is above those guys. And last but not least, Paolo. And I'll get into him in a second. But I don't understand why he is looked at as the way he is. Like yes, he's dominating or, or sort of dominating. But every time you look at it, like like the big games, for example. Uh, against Duke. That's the one I'm going to go to. That's the one I've watched three or four times. But he was kind of just like he, he had a solid game, but he it's almost like it's not impressive. Like, there's no thing like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of his game. I think he'll be an amazing NBA player, and I think he's definitely a unicorn. But he's just – I don't know. It's just I don't think he's – He's better than the guys below him, especially a guy like EJ Liddell. EJ Liddell is literally the go-to guy for Ohio State. He literally beat Dukes almost, I wouldn't say single-handedly, but he was the reason that they beat Duke. Without him, they don't do that. Um, A guy like Trace Jackson Davis, who was basically carrying Indiana um, this season. And then someone like Jabari Smith, who is rated way too low on this list. But he can absolutely score the ball from all three levels. Makes Auburn look unstoppable. When he looks unstoppable, Auburn looks unstoppable. So I don't understand it. Um, uh, and then it comes to Paolo, who I think is way too low on this list to begin with um, at 16. I don't understand how you can be uh, the projected number two or three pick. He slid for whatever reason. I don't understand it. Um, right here they say that we're yet to see a quote unquote signature game from Bancaro that can be chalked up to least partly to circumstance. And the way I look at it is, dude, what more do you want from this man? He is absolutely every time that he's been called upon, I wouldn't say every time, but the majority of the time he's been called upon, he's answered the bell. So I don't understand what more they would be looking for from him. If anything, he's had a better season to me than a Chet Holmgren. Like, he's been more impactful than than someone like that. But, hey, trying to keep my biases out of it. Uh, Colin Gillespie is too low for me. Travion Williams is too low. There's just a lot of guys that I, I, I think that this list was definitely um, – definitely needs some, some fine-tuning for sure. Um, but, yeah, but that's it for this week, guys. Um, I want to thank every one of you for joining me and listening to me rant and ramble about my favorite sport, that being college basketball. Um, I'm going to be back next week uh, with a lot more insight onto this world of college basketball. And, again, thank you for joining me. So, uh, without further ado, that is the full 40 for this week. I'll see you guys next week. Peace.